Hello cruel world, my name is Dr. Shaham Das. I'm a consultant forensic psychiatrist. I assess mentally disordered offenders for a living so that you don't have to. I've got a bit of a shocking case to discuss today. Basically in 1996, Michael Stone was convicted of the murders of complete strangers, Lynn and Megan Russell, and the attempted murder of Josie Russell. And this all happened in Kent in Southern England. Stone was sentenced to three life sentences with a tariff of 25 years. So I've actually recently been on a Channel 5 documentary about this case. Shout out Channel 5. I'll put some of the footage of that documentary later on in this video. But before that, I want to tell you a bit more about the background of the case and give you some more details. So this all happened on the 9th of July 1996 in a country lane in Kent. Lynn Russell was aged 45 at the time and she was with her two daughters, six-year-old Megan and nine-year-old Josie and also the dog. And they were tied up and savagely beaten with a hammer while walking home from a swimming gala. Just completely senseless, brutal, just kind of blows the mind really. Lynn, Megan and the dog were killed but Josie survived and made a recovery. Apparently what had happened is they'd walked past a parked car before Stone got out and he was wielding like a claw hammer, demanding money from them. They offered to actually go home and get some money, but he tied them up and he bludgeoned them. In the weeks after the murder, before his arrest, Stone and an accomplice had carried out a robbery somewhere else. So that just goes to show how kind of generally antisocial that he is. In July 1997, police charged and arrested the 37-year-old Michael Stone after tip-offs for a reconstruction of Crime Watch, the TV programme. So what happened is that a psychiatrist as well as two nursing staff called Crime Watch, the programme, saying that they believed it was to be Stone because of the reconstruction. They'd worked with him in the lead-up to the attacks. And a few days before the murder, apparently Stone was increasingly enraged, he was like violent, he was aggressive. He actually threatened to kill individual staff members and their families. So he clearly was in an agitated state, which is what made them suspect that he was the killer. But the kind of twist or the controversy of this case is there's never actually been any physical evidence to link Stone to the murders. So some people would say that even though he is a nasty piece of work, extremely antisocial, has caused a lot of harm, it might be a bit presumptuous to have connected him to the murders. Anyway, that's just a brief outline of the case. I'm going to leave you with some Channel 5 documentary. Um, and in that, I talk specifically about Stone's background. So he had a horrible, turbulent childhood. He himself su suffered from domestic violence. He was placed into a care home where he was abused. And the other issue that I talk about in the documentary is about drug use. So Stone was a, a known heavy drug user. So how does that tie into everything? Why is it relevant? How does drug use kind of disinhibit some people or, or cause them to act more violently in some social circumstances? Uh, before I go, I also want to say, buy my goddamn book. The paperback version, which I believe is cheaper and it's certainly lighter, doesn't do as much physical damage if you were to yet, if you were to throw it at your dog, is going to be available from the 9th of March. Go chiggity check it out. Um, and if you want to know more about this case, and it is a fascinating case, and I've actually done a much longer form video earlier on this channel. I'll put the links in the schmomish section below. <clears throat> and there's there's kind of more relevance to this case in the world of forensic psychiatry because these heinous murders actually sparked off a government campaign to indefinitely detain dangerous people and the government actually created a diagnosis called dangerous and severe personality disorder and they used uh, they used this like new scheme to detain people who were dangerous past their prison sentences so they were basically keeping people locked up after they'd served time in prison for their violent offences and the weird kind of aspect that's relevant to forensic psychiatry is that they they use mental illness to come up with this kind of bogus diagnosis and it was very controversial at the time because it was hugely expensive it wasn't particularly effective and a lot of psychiatrists forensic psychiatrists disagreed that it was fair they disagreed about the psych uh, about the diagnosis and also they felt that the resources were better used for people who had treatable kind of illnesses like schizophrenia, the, things, the kind of things that you can medicate and you can reduce the, the risk of violence and you can discharge people. Whereas with the government scheme, people were kind of shoehorned into this diagnosis and kept indefinitely. They couldn't really be changed or treated. So psychiatrists felt that the government kind of pressurized them and bullied them into using their own clinical skills and resources into something that, that, that they couldn't do, some to try and heal people that couldn't be healed. But anyway, go check it out. 
uh, my video if you want to know the details of that. The links are in the comment sections below. Until next time, have a blessed day and do not forget, I love you. So we know that a few days before the murder, Michael Stone visited the mental health care professionals and they were quite worried about his behaviour, his level of agitation and specifically his level of risk. He was making threats to kill his probation officer and his probation officer's family. And I think this is one of the reasons why those mental health care professionals had red flags flagged up. When we look at Michael Stone's childhood and his adolescence, to me, it's just a picture of a very turbulent, chaotic lifestyle and environment. So we know that he's been charged with criminal offences at a very young age, as young as 11. On top of all of that, when we look at him in his later years, we know that he was quite a violent individual. He was also quite criminally versatile. He'd been arrested for a number of different charges, from assaults to burglary to robbery. So we really get the picture of somebody who's, who's quite disturbed, quite chaotic, and potentially could be quite prone to violence. When we look at Stone's previous offending, we know that his first conviction for a very serious offence was in 1981, where he reportedly attacked a man with a mallet or a hammer, and he was charged with GBH and robbery. And then in 1983, he stabbed a man who was known to him in the chest. And then in 1987, he got sentenced for 10 years due to armed robbery. One interesting aspect to this case, in my view, is that we know that Michael Stone was a very heavy drug user. He spoke to some professionals and told them that he was spending about £100 a day on heroin and crack cocaine. There's a huge overlap with drug misuse and often this drives offending and there's a number of different forms and mechanisms. So in, in my clinical experience I've certainly assessed many different offenders who have drug and alcohol issues and often their type of offence, specifically their level of violence, is far higher when they're intoxicated, when they're disinhibited and when they're, when they're in that aggressive mindset than their baseline behaviour when they're relatively stable and sober. So when we look at the, at the connection between Michael Stone's drug use and these murders, there's a couple of different possibilities. It could be that he was actually intoxicated and using drugs heavily at the time, which would make him less inhibited and would make him more likely to commit violence. Or it could be that he was relatively sober at that moment in time, but was going through withdrawals and felt quite desperate for money. So it was almost like he would do anything that he had to do just to be able to, to get some money for his next fix. When we look at Stone's previous offending, even though there were very serious offences, you know, everything up to armed robbery, from stabbing somebody to different forms of assault, it's still a very big leap from that level of violence to go to a triple homicide. Levi Belfield has often been suspected of being the real perpetrator of the horrific murders against the Russells. And there is a connection in that his MO was very similar, hitting his victims over the head with a blunt object. 